Hello and welcome to the Capital Games Movie Club. I am The Wiz. Zero is, of course, out this week. I believe he found a portal in his Mazda Miata, and he's in his other world as we speak. I wonder if he has an other podcast partner. That'll be interesting to find out. We'll find out some other time. But anyway, let us get into the review of Coraline, uh, being voiced by Dakota Fanning, Ian McShane, and Terry Hatcher, directed by animation director Henry Selleck. I've been told that this movie is a great movie, uh, especially an especially very beautiful looking movie, especially if you were a fan of A Nightmare Before Christmas, because this is, of course, from the same director. I've always been told good things about this movie, and I never gave it a shot, but I thought, hey, since we're doing the non-scary, scary movies this week uh, as a theme to review... I thought, why not? This is no better time than ever than to watch this movie. Some some background. When it comes to Henry Selleck, of course I liked Nightmare Before Christmas. Do I get the big fandom around it? Not really, but it's a good enough movie. So I have really no problem with it getting its praise. I'm actually a big fan of James and the Giant Peach, although it's been a while since I've actually seen that movie. Speaking of, I remember watching Monkey Bone and enjoying it when I saw it like years ago. But looking at the reviews of not only the critics but of regular people when it comes to Monkey Bone, it getting like really low review scores, I might have to rewatch that again. And maybe I misremembered something because I actually thought I kind of liked that movie. I thought it was kind of cute and charming. But hey, maybe that'll be one that I will go ahead and rewatch at some other point. Uh, and of course, with animation and st specific stop motion animation, I do like the form. I, I definitely like the stop motion animation from Wes Anderson with his uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Isle of Dogs, uh, movies like that. And I am more of a fan of the Ardman uh, stop motion animation, like Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run. I love. Curse of the Were Rabbit, the the uh, Wallace and Gromit movie. I thought that was so good, and of course before that, I loved Chicken Run. So I I'm definitely a fan of animation. I, I definitely like the look and the feel of stop motion. I just never really got into Henry Selleck's work, which of course is Nightmare Before Christmas. I think he's the most popular with. I I get the appeal. But I guess I just didn't hang out with the goth kids all that much in high school, so I'm not really into it. But I understand the appeal. I understand why it's uh, a movie that people celebrate and actually enjoy, especially for its subversive dark humor. So I, I do understand why it is popular. Do I think it's a great movie? Not really, but it's good. It's a good movie. So let's get into Coraline. Coraline is a stop-motion animation feature, just like the other features that Henry Selleck has done. And this is based off of a book or a novella by Neil Gaiman, which I thought was very interesting when I uh, when I was watching the movie that this was based off of a Neil Gaiman story. Uh, I haven't read any of Gaiman's stuff, but I know they're fairly dark or they deal with dark themes. So that interests me right off the bat when I started watching the movie. So let's start off with basically the the film itself and the animation. The animation's great. Like the animation looks really good. Sometimes in certain aspects when it comes to like animation, especially stop motion animation, they can feel jerky at times and you kind of have to excuse that in, in certain types of especially older stop motion animation, I should I should clarify. In older stop motion animation, they do tend to look a little herky-jerky, and that's sometimes part of the charm. Not so in this. The animation's very fluid and very good-looking, and the the way the characters move and the way their mouths move feel like they are full of life, and I definitely enjoyed watching that the aesthetics of, of the movie, even though it is meant to be a dreary, dark, sort of depressing kind of movie. So... I, I did enjoy the way the animation is and how it looks and how everything moves on there. Themes for the movie. The movie basically is about a little girl who is neglected by her parents and finds a portal to 
another dimension that mirrors her own, but is better is a better version of what she has in her real life. So much so that she starts to prefer that that idealized version much more. With of course a possible dark side in that other world as well to a certain extent and i would say for the first half of the movie the theme really was interesting because they uh, the, th- the thing with kids movies or family movies which this movie is they tend to really sand down the rough edges they 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 want you to understand what's happening but they really want to dull the emotional effect so it's not too traumatizing. It's not too upsetting for kids, which then results in these movies not being respectful to, let's say, a, a kid's intelligence. And I don't think that's the case here in this movie. They definitely treat Coraline more realistically and make you understand why she is the way she is, why she's standoffish and kind of a brat, why she acts the way she does. She gets no attention at home. Things like that. And the way that the the character is done in the first half of the movie specifically is very good. And I really enjoyed that characterization as they went through the, the crux of the movie with her going back and forth into the dimensions uh, of the movie. The problem I had is that they kind of threw it away in the second half to do a kind of standard kids mo- family movie adventure esque movie uh, they 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 started going into the tropes which yes it is a kids movie it is a family movie and the majority of family movies do rely on these tropes to essentially not only not disturb kids but make parents comfortable enough to allow them to watch these movies which I think is also a cop-out because there are family movies or movies that are made for everybody that deal with powerful, maybe not disturbing, but upsetting topics that are actually good for all ages. Uh, Song of the Sea is a movie that I constantly will say that is technically a kid's movie, but I w- I can see adults not only loving it, but if a kid really gets into it, they want to get into more deeper and more complex animated movies or just movies in general. Because the way it's written and the way they characterize uh, what's going on is so well done that it, it treats its viewers and the characters very seriously and very respectfully. And unfortunately, I don't feel like Coraline does this. They still they still do the common... Uh, kids movie tropes where essentially the kid has to become a hero and battle a bad guy and fight it against all odds to do the right thing, etc., etc., etc. And that was kind of a disappointment when it came down to watch the movie with me. I will say this, for a kids movie, it, it doesn't harm it as much but as something that maybe i would recommend to an adult who is into animation and wants i would say that's that's something that is more towards adults or something that adults can enjoy on their own i don't really think i could recommend this movie whereas maybe i would do that for the nightmare before christmas now i am not saying that the nightmare before christmas is a better movie i'm sounding confusing and i'll explain why but I will say that it would be it would be harder for me to recommend Coraline to an adult who doesn't have kids than The Nightmare Before Christmas, where I can see an adult enjoying the movie by how subversive and funny it is, even though it is a musical. Uh, let's actually get into music as well in Coraline. The music's very good in this. Something I wasn't expecting, really, because it's not a musical movie in the sense... But there are musical numbers and there is uh, music in the background that fits the setting and the story quite well. So I, I really uh, thought the music fit the movie very well. 
and I definitely enjoyed the music as it was going on. Like most, the problem with music most times, especially in animated movies, is that either they either have to be for you to notice them, they have to be fantastic or they have to be awful. If they are in between, you just don't care, and it's not worth talking about. But these are actually very good songs, and there's a lot of really captivating and good music in the movie, which which builds onto the themes and on what you're seeing in the film. So I definitely enjoy the music and everything. The, the aesthetics and the music of this movie is really good. I Like I said, when it comes to animation, I slightly prefer Ardman movies like Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run, but I can definitely see why people like the style of animation from the Henry Selleck movies. So I have no problem with that. I think the animation is fantastic in this movie and, and the music as well. Compliments it real well. Voice acting performances. I came away surprised with Terry Hatcher in the movie who played the mother and she essentially plays two roles in this and plays them very well. Terry Hatcher is not really an actress that I have seen have a lot of depth in her movie roles and her TV roles. She, she essentially plays the same characters to a certain extent. She plays shades, I would say, of characters. Either she's a, well, she was a Bond girl in one of the Bond movies. I think it was Tomorrow Never Dies is where she was in, in a Bond movie. She was in Desperate Housewives where she played the plucky, really good, good-hearted good woman in that. She was uh, Lois Lane in The Avengers of Lois and Clark. That was eh, an okay... I, I know that was popular at the time, but I really wasn't that thrilled with it. But anyway, it was popular, whatever. I just wanted to say that with Terry Hatcher's performance in this movie, I was actually very surprised at the performance she gave because I actually really liked her perf her performance. Uh, Dakota Fanning was pretty good. I mean, it's a standard kids performance. I mean, it's I gotta be honest with you, it's kind of hard to criticize a kid's performance in an animated movie unless they're really, really bad, and that's not what Dakota Fanning is. Uh, performance was in this. It was it was pretty good, and I I definitely enjoyed her in this role, and I thought she did it pretty good. She didn't she wasn't a, a standout, but you know she she was good in it. And then a, a small shout out for Ian McShane who played a, a minor character. He, play, he played a Mr. Babinski, I think it was. Yeah, it was Mr. Babinski, and he was fine in this. I mean, I, I like Ian McShane, so when he was in it, I was like, okay, cool, Ian McShane's in this. But he was fine. Nothing to really stand out, stand home, like to, to write home about. But it was a, it was a good performance. I, I enjoyed it uh, for him specifically. Negatives. Okay. Like I said uh, towards the beginning, although I enjoy the movie, when I was watching the movie from the first half, I had strong four star vibes in this movie where I was saying like, wow, this is actually really good. And I am actually surprised by how good this is and that the hype I was hearing and the good things I've been hearing about this is like, okay, wow, it's true. So, well, I really missed out on something. Then the second half happens and it's like, oh, right. It's a kid's movie. I forgot. <laughs> it's like, oh man. And not that it is bad. It's just that I, when I was watching the movie, I hope the movie got a little bit darker or it dealt with more mature themes in that, in that aspect. And, and that essentially makes it, to me, makes me wish that it wasn't a kid's movie. It was more of a teenager slash adult movie to a certain extent, like something that was PG-13. Was this a PG-13 PG movie? Yeah, it was a PG movie. Yeah, that was more of a PG-13 movie than a PG movie because you couldn't do anything that violent or you couldn't do anything that scary in a PG movie. There are exceptions, of course, but around the time that this was made, which is 2009, there are definitely limits that you have in order to make this movie, in order to make this movie PG, 
And I think that held the movie back to where I think would have been best. I know there are fans of this movie who will disagree, and that's fine. I get that. But I looked at this thinking, I, I really wondered, like, wow, what if Gilmer, Guillermo del Toro did this movie? What if Alfonso Cuaron did this movie? What if John Carpenter did this movie? What if somebody who is afraid to, not afraid to go darker would have done this movie? What if they, what I really was asking is, what if Henry Selleck just didn't make a kid's movie and did it like this? What would it have been like? And is it unfair to criticize a movie for not doing what I want it to do? Possibly. But I really feel, I really feel if they went shades darker into the movie, I feel it would have benefited this movie more. I'm not saying go like really dark and gory and disgusting with dismemberment and all that crap. No. Flesh out the terror Flesh out the scariness a little bit more. Make it a little more disturbing. Make it a little more unsettling. And then maybe I think you would have had an all-time classic in this, where I thought that that would really work well. Other than, Without that, it's a very good kids movie. It's a very good adult. Uh, uh, it's a very good family movie. But if they would have went a step further, I think they would have had something really special. And I and I just felt disappointed by that. Not so much where I would hate the movie, but disappointed enough where I was questioning maybe the direction the movie went in. Okay, so we're going to get into spoilers for Coraline, the 2009 movie directed by Henry Selick. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, you can stop now come back and return or if you're on youtube you can just click on the youtube video that has the spoiler the spoilers of this movie on there we're gonna get started with spoilers of Coraline in five four three two one i'm not gonna do what i did with the last review and do spoilers and not spoil anything i'm gonna actually spoil parts of the movie sorry about that from last week so <laughs> i just want to point that out I know uh, a couple of you probably will listen to it and gone, you didn't spoil a damn thing. I will this time. So anyway, let's get into it. Second half of the movie, uh, when Coraline's parents gets kidnapped, is where I essentially was like, oh no, they're going this direction. And the reason why I felt this way was because... I was expecting the movie to be a little more darker in its tone and to maybe have the character of Coraline want to give in to her impulses more about being in that happy place and being in that happier area despite being a little creepy. What I'm saying is I think I would have ended the movie a little bit differently. I think I would have ended the movie in a sense where Coraline actually gives in to the other mother and basically decides at the end that she wants to be in that world. And then when it happens, she makes that she realizes the mistake she's made. I would have actually preferred that ending. Yes, it's dark. Yes, it's fucked up. I get it, the character as a kid, and maybe somebody doesn't want to watch a movie where a kid dies. I get that. But I think thematically, the movie would have worked a lot better if they would have went more dark as the movie went along. Instead, when, they, when she defied the other mother and said, no, I don't want to have my eyes sewed into buttons and, and turn into one of you guys, then all of a sudden, that mother character becomes the standard kids movie villain, I couldn't be helped but disappointed. Because when you do that, there's only so far you can go, especially with the themes that and, and the style of the movie that was being dealt with. Because the movie was darker and was dealing with more macabre-esque, it's not really macabre, I'll say macabre-esque uh, themes and looks and everything, you're only given so much leeway until it hits PG-13. And my recommendation, if <laughs> if the filmmaker was like, hey, what do you think? I would have said, no, go darker. 
go for the PG-13. You'll make a better movie that way. But, of course, PG-13 animated movies don't sell. They, especially R-rated movies, don't sell. Especially movies about kids. So, I get financially why they didn't do that. But, it to me, I, I really felt that the movie would have been better if the character wasn't aware of the danger she was putting herself in, but the movie hinted to the audience more and more as the movie went along that she is in grave danger and she's not realizing it. I think that would have been a much more emotionally resonant movie where the theme would have been more like, be careful when you go for... like I think the theme essentially was in the beginning, be careful going for the easy route and going for the thing that feels good because sometimes the thing that feels good is the thing that kills you in the end and for that to be in a film like this I thought would have been a fascinating thing to actually to actually dive into with this type of animation and with the characters and the themes that were being dealt with especially with child neglect being a main theme in the movie I thought that would have been outstanding to do, but they went a different direction, and I was disappointed by that, honestly. Again, I mentioned in the the non-spoiler review, that's a little unfair to judge a movie based on what they don't do. And what they did do is fine, is good, not fine, it's good. It's a good movie. I enjoyed it. It, it was it was definitely an entertaining movie uh, for what for what they give. It is an entertaining movie. Like I said, I just wish that they respected the intelligence of the people who are watching this, especially kids, because I really think if they went a little darker, kids could handle it. I, I really think they could. And this, because I think parents are either unafraid or very afraid to give darker themed movies to their kids to watch because they're afraid to upset them, or they think they're not just they're just not emotionally. They're not emo. They, they think they're not emotionally mature enough to handle it. Which I gotta tell you, there's a lot of kids who can handle m- more disturbing things better than I think most adults can. I'm not saying for them to watch disturbing ass movies. Don't get me wrong, but I think they're able to comprehend and handle heavier topics than I think parents really give them credit for. If the studio were able to, were, were willing to make that take that risk, I think it would have really benefited. But that being said, as a kids movie, it is good and it is a, an entertaining movie that I would have no problem recommending for a kid who is into these themes. That this being a novella also uh, means that a lot of stuff was added into it, and sometimes that's a recipe for disaster. Like if you have to add things into the movies that wasn't in the original vision, sometimes the the trend that keeps happening is that someone writes themselves into the story, which doesn't fit in the story at all. Which is not what happens in this movie. I think uh, YB, I, I think is the the character. Uh, he was not in the book, but he turned out to be a decent character. He he wasn't that bad. Uh, for the, the movie at all. So I, I thought that was pretty good. It, this is a tough thing to criticize. A part of me wishes they dove more into the child neglect that Coraline was dealing with. But then I don't know how you would square that with the movie. Un- unless they go the route I wanted to, them to go, which is to have Coraline want to more and more be in that world than to suddenly do a hard no in that first half of the film. I think that would be the only way to do that. But then, I don't I don't know if that... It really depends. A part of me wants to say yes, they should have probably went more into the child neglect issues of Coraline. But I don't know exactly how that would work. So I'm, I'm torn. I'm honestly a little torn on that. It might have worked. But yeah, you would have to do some real finessing for it to work in this movie. Because I think they did the child neglect thing pretty well in this. But just well enough to not 
overly disturb and overly upset a, a young audience. Whereas if this was an adult movie, I think this would be a, a little more upsetting or a little more disturbing uh, on that note. The final battle with Other Mother was kind of a letdown too. Like, I I get the, the whole game thing. And this is, again, another trope of kids' movies where the kid is the hero and has to beat the evil adult. And it's fine. Like, I, I, I don't want to come across hating this movie because I don't. It's a, it's a good movie. I just, like I said, I just came off disappointed that they went the direction they went in the second half. Doesn't make it bad. I did still enjoy it. I just think it would have been a lot better if they went a different direction. So, yeah, that's that's really it with that uh, segment on that one, at least. All right, so let me get into my final thoughts for Coraline. Coraline, as a strictly a family or kids movie, is a very good movie. It is very enjoyable. I think kids who don't mind the dark setting and the animation are really going to enjoy this movie, especially if they like dark stories. If they like dark stories, I don't see why they wouldn't like Coraline. But as an adult, <laughs> I know, I know, some of you are like, why are you reviewing kids' movies? That isn't, uh, kids' movies, they're not meant for you. Well, the thing is, a lot of kids' movies nowadays try to appeal to the adults too. So, and if they do, and Coraline does do that to a certain extent, it's okay to criticize on that end. If it's strictly a kid's movie, like, I'm not going to review a Barney movie, okay? I'm not going to review a Thomas the Tank Engine movie. That would be silly. But in this aspect, I think it's fair to criticize the fact that I think that Coraline, to a certain extent, kind of wussed out and didn't respect the audience that it had. And it respect not only the kids, but the adults that watched it as well. So they went the kids' movie route, and... It didn't make the movie bad. It still was a good movie. I just think with the setting and everything that it was doing creatively, it, they could have done much more with it. But with what they had, it is a very good movie. I give it three and a half stars. If they would have went a different direction and nailed it, this could have been a four or a very rare four and a half star for me. As is right now, I understand the fandom. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good movie, but it's a three and a half for me. I kind of wish they went a different direction, but since they didn't, it's fine. Good movie, three and a half stars for Coraline. Why don't we get into some discussion about uh, some quotes and things that happened in the movie industry this week. IGN had an interesting quote from James Cameron. Now, there is a theme with quote-unquote auteurs and really celebrated directors who really shit on the MCU and DCEU. Uh, Martin Scorsese is a great example of that. He, he calls them lesser films, essentially, and is dismayed that audiences are flocking to go see those movies, which, being a fan of the MCU movies, I understand where he's coming from, but I think he's also coming to it at a point of ignorance. Because he is a, is a director, too, that will praise John Ford and will praise Sergio Leone. But they made fantastic movies on popular, me, on popular types of movies as well, the Westerns. And there were buttloads of Westerns back then, like from black and white to color. I think it was from like the 30s to the 50s. There were nothing but Westerns, like ass loads of Westerns. At the time, too, if, if I recall correctly from what I've read, critics said the same thing about Westerns. They were like, oh, these are just B-movie schlocky, dealing with the same things over and over again movies. And it wasn't until later when people started to realize that, oh, wow, John Ford was a fantastic director. Look what he did with The Searchers. Or look what he did with Stagecoach. Or Real Bravo. This is what happens like with popular mediums and popular media in general because they're popular the auteurs or the film snobs me being one of them i will admit the auteurs and film snobs will look down on popular stuff and say oh they must like it because it's trash 
or they must like it because it's just for entertainment. You can't take that seriously, which is really unfair, which is why I'm going to... I'm going to say this quote now. This is from James Cameron. I forget. I don't know. He was talking to the New York Times. And his quote is this when he and IGN posted it on their feed. It says James Cameron criticizes MCU and DC character relationships. Okay, here it goes. Quote, when I look at their big spectacular films, I'm looking at you, Marvel and DC. It doesn't matter how old the characters are. They all act like they're in college. They have relationships, but they really don't. They never hang up their spurs because of their kids. The things that, that really ground uh, the really ground us and give us power, love, and a purpose, those characters don't experience it. And I think that's not the way to make movies. There's two problems with this quote. I'm going to get to the fir- I'm going to get to the first problem, which is his criticisms. I've seen every MCU film. I've seen almost every DCEU film. The bad ones definitely have these problems. The relationships don't mean squat. They really don't. But that's the bad ones. Okay, that I will give him. But he's discounting the good ones. The the Avengers. Like, good relationship, like Thor Ragnarok, things like that. Like, especially Natasha Romanoff, specifically that character with her relationship with Bruce Banner and her relationship with Clint Barron, with Clint Barton, I should say, who is Hawkeye. They gave Romanoff and Barton a lot of depth in the Avengers. Yes, they were about 15, 20 minutes worth of depth, but there is a character relationship there, and it does move forward throughout the entire series. They also did it with Bruce Banner, with Bruce's obvious attraction to Natasha Romanoff, who's Black Widow. That is there. It definitely is. And if you don't even go into MCU, okay? If you want to just say, all right, well, MCU, it takes you like three, four, five films to get that, blah, 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 blah. Okay, get the criticism, fine. Let's do a comic book movie, Logan. Logan is a fantastic movie that has very good, well-developed relationships with the principal characters and give enough character to all of them to make you feel for them and want to emote and really feel with what their plight is going through. Okay, Is it rare that that happens in these comic book movies? Yes, it is. But to say that there is no relationships and that there is no none of that at all through any of these films, that they act like a certain, like they like like they're in college, and that these relationships don't matter, is incredibly short sighted and goes to show that either a he has not watched all these movies, or b he goes into these movies watching them already knowing what he wants to get out of it or what he thinks, and he's just using it to enforce those opinions. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is James Cameron. <laughs> okay, yes, I get James Cameron. Vision, vision wise, like visuals, is a incredible director. He does outstanding imagery in his movies: uh, Avatar, Titanic, Terminator Two, The Abyss, Aliens. Yes, okay, he is a fantastic visual director. He can't write for shit. He can't. He is a terrible writer. I don't care if you love these movies or not. And I know there are people who love Avatar and love Titanic. I get it, okay? But dear God, the characters that he writes are so paper thin that anybody could write them with a, a basic knowledge of screenwriting. I'm sorry, but it's true. His best movie, in my opinion, is Terminator 2. The writing in that is okay, but it's also unimportant. It is so unimportant. His other movies like Titanic and Avatar, good God, I I do not get the love that Avatar gets sometimes. Before the sequel had a trailer this past year, no one talked about Avatar. Everyone was like, yeah, that was kind of weird that it got so much money. It really wasn't that good. Why was it? How did this get so popular? Yeah, it was beautiful. That was like Pocahontas. It was like, there was nothing, I don't even know the character's name. I still don't know the character's name. I don't know any of the character's name. I barely remember the plot. 
like there's nothing in Avatar specifically that screams great writing. Same for Titanic. Titanic is a standard disaster movie that has really good actors, really good actors, doing eh, dialogue in a okay story with fantastic visual effects. That's James Cameron. For him to say that these relationships have no meaning or they they don't have relationships or they don't have power or purpose or love or whatever is a fucking joke. Now, Scorsese can say that. And Scorsese can be like, yeah, it has these problems. It's like, okay, well, you're Scorsese. You not only do visually great movies, but you also have very well-written movies, and you do them very well. You deserve that. You have, you get a pass. I don't agree with him, but you get a pass. Okay? Fine. Cameron, on the other hand? Come on, guys. Cameron, like I said, visually is a fantastic director. It's time to get real here. And I think this is going to bear out when Avatar 2 comes out, Avatar The Way of Water comes out this year. The public is going to start realizing that his movies are just not written well. And the only thing that you get out of the characters in those movies is basically the, the feelings that you put into it. And that's it. Like, really describe the character of Jack in... Titanic or Rose, you can probably do it in a sentence, maybe a few words, if that. The villain of the movie of Titanic, I forgot his name, but Billy Zane played him, okay? He's as stereotypical as he comes. I mean, these are not in-depth characters that he writes, and for him to turn around and go, oh, this writing is not that good, bro, look at the movies you make. You're, you're no hot shakes either, my friend. But hey, you make all the money, you get all the fans, you you got the you made the most money out of any director. Fine, that's that's fine. But you can't sit here and say that you know what's best when it comes to great screenwriting because that's your one fatal weakness. You're just not a good screenwriter at all. I would love to see someone write his movies and him direct it and see how that goes. Kind of like an opposite Kevin Smith. I would want Kevin Smith to write a movie and let somebody else direct it. That would be my wish for Kevin Smith. I'm the opposite with James Cameron. I wish James Cameron would direct a movie that someone else has written. But James Cameron has all the power and the money. He's going to make his movies his way. And eventually people are going to realize that they're just not that well written. But we'll see when that happens. Okay, so we are at the end of the episode. Before we go, I'm going to get into the final question of this episode. We talked about an animated movie uh, and Coraline today. And I thought uh, this was an interesting topic to talk about uh, since we're watching Coraline. And it's got to do with animation and, ad and adults. There is a small contingency of adults who really like watching animated movies and animated TV shows, especially anime, because anime tends to be very, like anime is very popular in Japan. So they do a lot of different anime on a lot of different things. They have slice of life anime. They have horror anime. They have action anime, sci-fi, blah, blah, blah. They have all sorts of anime. So if you're into animation and you're an adult, you're probably watching a lot of anime. I don't watch a lot of anime, but I do enjoy the works of Satoshi Kon, and I do like Hayao Miyazaki, so I like their films a lot. And I, I do give other directors a shot. I forgot the person who did Your Name. I like Your Name. Uh, oh, is it Makoto Shinkai, I think his name is? I'm probably getting that wrong. I'll, 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 I'll defer on that one. But I do like Japanese animation, but yeah, a part of me also wishes that America would do a lot more animation for adults. I know there's the Harley Quinn show that is on HBO Max. I know Rick and Morty is still sort of is still popular, I think, at this point. But other than that, the rest is aimed for kids. And I think that's going to continue because there was a quote from CEO of Disney, Bob Chapek. 
And I guess he was asked a question on a Wall Street Journal live stream about anim- animated movies and TV shows for adults. This is the quote. Uh, Disney's CEO explains how animation is strictly for kids. Quote, I'm always, I always say that when parents put their kids to bed at night after watching an animated film, they're probably not going to turn into, a, turn into another animated movie. They want something for them. I know for people who watch all sorts of films and all sorts of different stuff that they know this quote is kind of bullshit. And I get that. You, you also need to understand that he is not talking to you. He's talking to Joe Blow Parent, who is under the impression that animated movies are for kids. And it's weird that an adult will want to watch an animated movie because he's been taught and he's been and it's been confirmed to him and her that those are kids movies and I don't want to watch a kids movie in order to relax. You can show them Paranoia Agent or you can show him you can show that person Redline or the or God, what's the Wolf House? And they'll still look at you and like, yeah, but those are really for kids and that's inappropriate to make a movie that kids will want to watch but make it adult. That's highly inappropriate. And unfortunately, a lot of people still think this way. I have to be careful with who I recommend animated movies to because the question I always get always is, okay, but I don't think my kid will be interested in that. <laughs> and then I And then I will always say, Yeah, but it's not really for your kids. It's for you. Like, why would I want to watch a cartoon? Cartoons are for kids. I cannot tell you how many times I've been told that. Even when, even when people praise Quentin Tarantino for putting an animated sequence in Kill Bill Volume 1 that was really cool, there is still the stigma that animation is just for kids. And until that stigma is broken, these CEOs will always think this way. And the other reason why they think this way is purely business. What animated shows make the most money? Bluey, Blue's Clues, Paw Patrol, Kaleo, Peppa Pig. You you see where I'm coming from here. Animated shows for kids ages 2 to 7 are the ones that essentially make the most money because not only are they going to keep watching the movie, uh, keep watching the show, and give ratings because parents leave it on to just keep them distracted, but they also want to buy the toys. So the parents are going to buy those toys to make those kids happy. So that means merch sales. And you're going to buy the cute little t-shirt for little Billy with the Paw Patrol because he likes Paw Patrol and he looks so darn adorable in that shirt. So that's more that you'd get. Is there exceptions? Yes. Of course, I mentioned Rick and Morty. And uh, an exception for me is Avatar The Last Airbender, which I think is one of the 10 best TV shows ever. Ever. It's a great TV show. The Simpsons is another example. I used to think that The Simpsons was a great TV show, but then they stayed on for about 20 years longer than they should have, and, well, I'm not getting into that. I I piss off so many people with that uh, with that take. But my point being, adult animation is the exception, not the rule. And what animators have to do, essentially, is work on a small budget to make a really good product that adults will like. And then when they prove that adults like it, then they'll get the money to do more. And there's very few animation houses that are willing to take that risk. There really isn't. In in Japan, definitely, they'll do it. In America, no, not really. And with these companies like WB, W Discovery, and with Disney slashing budgets and slashing specifically the animation budgets of all of their studios, this is going to continue to happen. And that saddens me too, because I enjoy animated movies and there are definitely some animated movies that i enjoy more than some quote-unquote real adult movies 
Look, I will, till I'm blue in the face, I will say that Spirited Away is one of the best directed movies I have ever seen. I think Song of the Sea is a movie that I think everybody should see. There are animated movies that I adore as films, period, that deserve more praise than they actually get. Song of the Sea is that for me. If, if someone wants, hey, what's a good animated movie? See Song of the Sea. If you haven't seen it yet, you owe it to yourself to see Song of the Sea. It is a fantastic movie. It is so emotionally resonant and beautiful. It is so good. If you haven't seen it, watch Song of the Sea. We are the exception, not the rule. And as long as parents still think this way and adults still think this way and that you're weird for liking animated movies, this is going to continue, unfortunately. Hell, despite the gaming industry being multi-billions of dollars worth of sales and the average age of gamers is around the 30 to 35 range, they still have a stigma of being just for kids. I don't see this stopping anytime soon. I guess the only thing I can tell you is support those animators in whatever projects they're doing if you are really interested in getting animated projects for adults. But other than that, don't expect Disney and and WB Discovery to do these anytime soon. Did I also hear that Adult Swim had to cut back some some of their stuff too i mean uh cnn uh oh, not cnn cartoon network got chopped i know that for a fact so i don't know so yeah if you're really into it i guess you gotta start supporting as much as you can because unless these companies start realizing there's a market there's there's a market they're just not gonna put the money into it so yeah the, the, it's sad but unfortunately that's the case and this end. And yes, I know some of you are going to point out uh, the DC animated movies. They're they're more for teens, but I know I know adult like I enjoy some of them, but they're more marketed to teens specifically, except for Harley Quinn, which is an adult animated TV series that has a legacy to it. So since it's based off of a Batman character who's very popular, they will keep that going until it just fails to make any money yeah at this point when it comes to adult animation we're kind of boned here guys you're probably going to see less and less of it at at this point and you're going to see more and more movies and tv shows that are aimed at younger and younger kids adult if you're looking for animation shows for adults yeah go the anime route i don't think you have much of a choice at this point sorry guys i wish i had better news for you all right, so we are at the end of the episode. Before we go, I'm going to talk about the topics, that, the topic that we're going to have for the next couple of weeks and the movie that we're going to watch. Okay, so the, the Halloween season is going to be over by the time we get to the new episode, and thank God, because, yeah, I'm not going to get into it. I don't like Halloween so much, but anyway, that's over. So we don't have to worry about the scary stuff anymore or the Halloween-themed movies. So I thought... A good idea before we get into the holiday movies for like Christmas and Thanksgiving is we do some noir November. That's right. Noir films are basically crime films that most of them are in black and white, but there are a few colorized noir films. But they deal with like dark themes that are in more of like a crime based uh, setting uh, or a crime based movie. I thought that we would watch some classic celebrated noir. And the movie I am choosing this week is the 1958 movie starring, written, and directed by Orson Welles. That's Touch of Evil, which stars Charlton Heston, Orson Welles, and Janet Leigh. I saw the beginning of this film in a film appreciation class. And I just never got around to watching the full film. I bought this at a sale, I think a year ago, and I've been meaning to watch it. But now I'm gonna I'm gonna take that chance now, and we're gonna watch Touch of Evil for next week. We are gonna be watching part of Noir November, Touch of Evil, starring Orson Welles, Charlton Heston, and Janet Leigh, 
written and directed by Orson Welles. We will talk to you next week.